number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You're going to hear part of a lecture about the introduction of cane toads into Australia. First, look at questions one to five. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 5. In today's lecture, I want to look at one of Australia's least loved animals, but one that has an interesting history, from which I think we can learn a fundamental lesson about problem solving. While Australia is famous for its many wonderful native animals, in particular the kangaroo and the koala, it also has some less attractive animals, many of which were actually brought to Australia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Perhaps the most well-known introduced animal is the rabbit, brought originally by the early settlers as a source of food. Another animal to be introduced by the settlers was the fox, for the purpose of sport in the form of fox hunting. But perhaps the most unusual animal ever brought here was the cane toad. Here's a picture of one. It's a large and, some people would say, very ugly species of toad and was deliberately imported to this country by the sugarcane farmers in 1935 to eradicate the beetle which kills the sugarcane plant. The cane beetle is the natural enemy of the sugarcane plant. It lives in the cane and drops its eggs onto the ground around the base of the plant. The eggs develop into grubs, and then the grub eats the roots of the cane, resulting in the death of the plant. In the mid-thirties, there was a serious outbreak of cane beetle, and the farmers became desperate to get rid of the pest which was ruining their livelihood. Now you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Listen to the rest of the lecture and answer questions 6 to 10. Meanwhile, news was trickling in from overseas about a toad, native to Central America, which supposedly ate the beetles which killed the cane. It was reported that the toad had been taken to Hawaii, where cane is also grown, and introduced with apparent success. So, with the backing of the Queensland authorities, the farmers arranged to import 100 toads from Hawaii. The toads were then released into the cane fields to undertake the eradication of the cane beetle. As predicted, the toads started to breed successfully, and within a very short time their numbers had swollen. But there was one serious problem. It turned out that cane toads do not eat cane beetles. And the reason for this is that toads live on insects that are found on the ground, and the cane beetle lives at the top of the cane plant, well out of reach of the toads. In fact, they never come into contact with each other. Now, you may well ask, how did this terrible mistake ever happen? And the reason is quite simply that the farmers were desperate to find a way of ridding their fields of the cane beetle, and so they accepted the reports that had been written without ever doing their own research. And the added irony is that in 1947, just 12 years later, an effective pesticide was developed which kills the beetle, thereby ensuring the survival of the sugarcane industry to this day. Meanwhile, much of tropical northeast Australia is infested with the cane toad, which serves no purpose whatsoever, and experts claim that the toad is spreading south in plague proportions. Now, as agricultural scientists we have to ask ourselves, what lessons are to be learned from this tale? And I can think of three main points. 
Firstly, one should never rely on claims which are not backed up by evidence, i.e., in this case, evidence that the cane toad actually eats the grub of the cane beetle and thereby kills the pest. Secondly, we should look very carefully at possible effects of introducing any living species into a new environment. And lastly, one should not allow one's decision-making to be influenced by a sense of desperation which may cloud the issue. In other words, one should always seek objective advice. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a man giving information to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, University of Radstock students, and thank you for coming out today. As some of you may already know, my name is Scott Barnes, and I am the director of the Student Services Office here at the university. I'm here today to give you some information about what Student Services has to offer you. To begin with, let me just say that I feel that our office will play an important role in the way that all of you will experience your time here at Radstock as students. Primarily, our center is geared towards providing answers to any questions you may have. Because all of our reception staff are currently enrolled as students at Radstock, we feel that we're in an excellent position to deal with any issues you may face during your time here at the university. As I said earlier, the Student Services Office is mainly a place where you can have your queries answered. However, the office is more than that. For example, if you come and visit us, you can pick up your student discount cards. Now, with these cards, which come at no additional cost to you, you can take advantage of reductions of up to 40% on all forms of public transport in the city. In addition, the cards are honored at many shops and restaurants in the area, giving you the chance to save up to 35% off food, beverages, and other purchases. Our office is also the place you should visit if you would like to get involved in any of the 30 different clubs and societies available at Radstock. Come in any time between 10 and 3 on weekdays, and sign up to become a member of the university choir or orchestra, the drama or debating club, the university trivia team, the list goes on and on. For new students, I cannot stress enough how vital it is to participate in the non-academic side of university life. Yes, we are here to work hard and do our best at our studies, but student life is also about having fun and meeting like-minded people. So, bearing that in mind, make sure that you get involved and enjoy yourselves. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Moving along, I'd now like to talk to you about another very important service that our office provides, and that is counseling. I'm sure that you are all well aware that there are times in life when things can go wrong and times can get tough. We all have to endure difficult experiences, and these difficulties can be emotional or physical. Whatever the case may be, 
talking with an experienced counselor can help you through the trying times. The counseling service here at Radstock is staffed by counselors who are qualified to help you deal with problems ranging from homesickness and loneliness to eating difficulties and life changes. To see a counselor, we recommend that you first visit our drop-in center. We run drop-in sessions on a daily basis from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And to reserve one of these sessions, you can telephone the counseling service on 121-5648-3907 on the day you wish to visit. Or, if you prefer, you can come into the student services office anytime after 8.30 a.m. and complete a booking form. If it should happen that you need to cancel your appointment for the drop-in session, we would request that you contact the counseling service as soon as possible to let them know. Drop-in sessions can be as short as 20 minutes, but it's more usual for them to take about 45 minutes. During that time, you will be asked some questions to clarify your situation, and a decision will be made as to what further action, if any, should be taken. After your session, several things may happen. Firstly, you may be referred to one of the university's counselors for further counseling, which normally consists of another eight sessions. Secondly, you may be asked to visit another source of help within the university, or finally, you may be referred to an external organization. Whatever course of action might be taken, you may rest assured that what goes on in these sessions is treated in strict confidence. I'd also like to mention that the Counseling Service runs numerous workshops on the campus every year. The focus of these workshops tends to be on personal development, and past topics have included motivation, self-identity, and impression management. There is no fee charged for these workshops, and if you require more information, feel free to contact us at stuser at acadia.co.uk. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. In this section, you'll hear an interview on IQ tests. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 21 to 30. Mrs. Kellerman, a specialist in child psychology, is interviewed by Bridget. Mrs. Kellerman, why is it that some children perform much better than others at school? Obviously, it can't be denied that certain children are brighter than others, but it's not as simple as that. A lot of emphasis is placed on intelligence measured by tests, so-called IQ tests, which only measure certain types of intelligence, such as basically linguistic and numerical skills, or reading and mathematics, to put it plainly, which is unfortunate because some children are bound to suffer. A good example was a friend of mine's son who was kept out of the top class at school because of his average IQ. That's around 100. His father, though he had no idea his son was going to be an architect, always said he was a clever child. Apparently, he was able to picture things in his mind and draw accurately at a very early age. The point is that his university life might not have been so difficult if his ability had been recognized sooner. What you're saying, then, is that some children have abilities that are not easy to measure, that aren't appreciated by many schools. Precisely. 
and if these schools are not spotted sufficiently early, they cannot be developed. That's why, in my view, there are so many unhappy adults in the world. They are not doing the things they are best at. What are those other kinds of intelligence? How can we recognize them in our children? Well, take musical talent. Many children never get the chance to learn to play an instrument, but while they might not become great artists or composers, they may get a lot of pleasure and satisfaction. Musically gifted children are fascinated by all kinds of sounds, car horns, animal noises, and so on, and they can easily recognize tunes and sing them in key. How can a parent encourage them? Sing to them and teach them new songs. Buy a piano or even a cheap instrument such as a recorder. If you can afford it, send them to music lessons as soon as possible. Play recordings of different instruments to them. What about a child who is good at sport? Could that be described as a form of intelligence? Most certainly, we psychologists call it motor or bodily intelligence. These children move gracefully and handle objects skillfully. A child who finds it easy to take things apart and use various tools may well become an engineer with the right encouragement. We should give them models to make and take them to science museums. However, unless these children are also good with words and numbers, they will probably not do well in school examinations. Is there anything a parent can do to help in this case? Yes, it may be worth spending money on private lessons, but you know, hardly anyone is good at everything. In my opinion, a child should be judged on his individual talents. After all, being happy in life is putting your skills to good use, no matter what they are. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about a crater in Australia. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Lake Akraman in South Australia is Armageddon for the purist. No other meteorite impact on Earth has stamped the surrounding rocks with such an abiding, unequivocal geological record of collision, earthquake, wind, fire, and tsunami. The giant waves formed by major Earth movements. The story it tells is elemental, without dying dinosaurs or even Bruce Willis to complicate its simple message of destruction. First, the numbers. About five hundred and ninety million years ago, a rocky meteorite more than four kilometers across, and travelling at around ninety thousand kilometers an hour, slammed into an area of red volcanic rock. About four hundred and thirty kilometers northwest of Adelaide, within seconds the meteorite vaporized in a ball of fire, carving out a crater about four kilometers deep and forty kilometers in diameter, 
and spawning earthquakes fierce enough to raise 100-metre-height tsunamis in a shallow sea 300 kilometres away. Ancient, stable and unglaciated, the bedrock of Australia preserves some of the most photogenic impact craters in the world. Ackerman is not one of them. Half a billion years of erosion has taken its toll. A salt pan surrounded by low hills is all that remains to mark the site of the cataclysm. The true nature of the place dawned on geologist George Williams of Adelaide University in 1979. Gazing at a sheaf of newly acquired satellite images, he saw the small circular shape of Lake Ackerman surrounded by a ring of faults and low scarps 40 kilometres across, and an outer ring twice this size. A year later, he made it to the site. On islands near the centre of the lake, Williams found bedrock shattered in a conical pattern that experts consider a sure sign of a meteorite impact. Except for a crater, which had long since eroded, the area was a textbook example of an impact site. In 1985, further intriguing evidence turned up. Vic Gostin, another Adelaide geologist, had been studying a thin band of fragmented red volcanic rock in 600 million year old shale in the Flinders Ranges, more than 300 kilometres east of Ackerman. To his bewilderment, the volcanic chunks turned out to be a billion years older than the shale. Where had they come from? Comparing samples, Gostin and Williams found that their rocks were identical. The red rock in the Flinders Ranges had been blasted there from Ackerman. Later, the same material turned up at sites 500 kilometres from Ackerman. Everywhere, the bands of fragments showed the same structure. Coarse pebbles at the bottom, then a cocktail of silt and sand, then layers of increasingly fine sand distorted on top into a wavy, scalloped pattern. These layers also show, step by step, how the meteorite transformed the floor of an ancient sea hundreds of kilometres away, according to Malcolm Wallace of Melbourne University. First came the earthquake. Travelling at about three kilometres a second, shock waves arrived offshore within a minute or two of the collision, stirring up the water with clouds of silt as the seabed shook. Then shattered rock from the explosion arrived by air. Pebbles and boulders crashed into the water, reaching a depth of about 200 metres within a minute. One day they would become the lower band of the Flinders Rock. Sand took up to an hour to come to rest, finally bedding down with the silt that was also now settling on the sea floor, as the effects of the earthquake died away. This mixture would eventually form the next layer. About an hour after the meteorite's impact, huge waves rolled in, leaving the ripples on the surface that later hardened into rock. Clear as mud is not an oxymoron. In Ackerman, the arid, timeless Australian outback has preserved the closest thing the earth can boast to a perfect pockmark, the pinnacle of imperfection. That is the end of Test 4.